is that you should get it to be as ideal as possible. And then you should put red ropes around it like you're at a museum and everybody just looks at it and nobody touches it. Right. And you just use that to your advantage. Like it's just a face card that you can pull up to a bank with and say, look, look at my near perfect or perfect personal credit profile and use that to actually get business approvals and keep that ball rolling again and again and again on the business side, maintaining those balances and servicing the debt and all that on the business side only and letting your personal credit profile remain untouched. So that's the concept. That's the long-term game plan. Okay, so what do we actually need in order to have an optimized personal credit profile? Don't let this next slide overwhelm you. This is just the end goal, but we're gonna talk about how to get to this point. But you could technically screenshot this and know that, okay, these are my markers that I'm trying to get to. You could be, like I said, starting from scratch. You could be dealing with negatives or you can be kind of maybe halfway there and you just need to, you know, have a little bit of a custom uh, end, you know, what's it called? The second half to your journey. That's why it's kind of tough to make these, uh, you know, broad sweep uh, rules for you guys is because everyone's situation is a little different. Some people already have a couple installment loans, et cetera. And you'll see me kind of get OCD on explaining stuff later on. But yeah, so you're going to want three to five personal credit cards. Those are revolving accounts. And these are cards that you applied for. So not trade lines and not authorized user accounts. And ideally, these would be bank issued cards by top tier banks. So we'll show a list of banks in the, in the next few slides. And ideally, some people ask me like, well, how much credit is too much credit on the personal side? I would say if you have three to five credit cards and you're just going to rock out with those, between 10 to 20K as your end goal of limits to have on those cards is ideal. You're not going to look over leveraged on the personal side if you keep it between that range. Again, if you're a little above uh, 20K, it doesn't even matter that much. But the point is you're not trying to go for the 80K flagship card for no reason. And because to me, I'd say you want to have those high limits on the business side uh, because you don't want to show that you have, and this can be a denial reason, too much access to unsecured revolving credit lines. And uh, I'd rather just leave my personal not looking scary to the banks and just use it to run it up on the business side. Moving on, the installment loans, I would say at least one to two, at least one though, bare minimum, because you need that credit mix. So you can't only have revolving accounts, right? Not just credit cards. You'll notice that if you have, we'll say three to five personal credit cards and you get one installment loan, even though that installment loan, let's say you get it tomorrow and it pops up tomorrow, just, you know, in a perfect scenario that you'll probably see a score boost because even though that new account was brand new, right? Zero months old. So it dropped your average age, which normally is a bad thing to have a brand new account pop up. It's probably going to do more for you in the sense of having that credit mix. So you're probably actually going to see a boost. And that happened to me right before I ran for funding on my own. I had about six primary accounts. So I had six credit cards and I had no installment accounts. I went ahead and I got a pledge loan hack done. And I'll show you guys exactly how I did that. And the pledge loan hack is an installment loan hack that we um, use to our benefit. And my score went up like 30 points right before funding. And I was able to get 20K plus approvals on all my cards, even with that brand new installment account. So it did a lot more beneficial. Um, you know, it was, it was a lot more beneficial to me on my credit than it was, you know, a detriment. Moving on here. So average age, I would look for two years or more on your primary accounts. That's most ideal. Remember, obviously you can't really speed that up. Uh, there's primary, uh, what are they called? Um, primary rental trade lines. You could add on like boom pay and stuff like that, but they're not like super plentiful and not everybody can get approved for those. But eventually you're going to want to get to two years plus. You can run plenty of personal funding and plenty of business funding before you get to that two year mark. But again, that's just something ideal to shoot for. Uh, we'll talk about AUs and how that can supplement that too. Keep your inquiries low. Again, only apply when you know you're going to get approved. So I would keep it to three inquiries or less in every six month period. And depending on what you know or how you're planning to go about how aggressive in your funding, uh, you, you know, you could be wiping inquiries on Experian or other bureaus if you wanted to. Utilization at one to 4%, that is per account. So not just uh, in general, sometimes people will have a maxed out credit card. Let's say it's only 500 bucks, but it's maxed out. That's actually, it's actually doing uh, the equivalent of, we'll say a missed payment. Like it's actually really bad for your score 
even though on average you could be like, oh, well, you know, my average utilization is within a good range, but you should look at each individual account and make sure that each individual account is 10% or below. I like to stay between one to 4%. And then no negatives, of course, obviously like you need to go through repair if you already have negatives and you're trying to get those off. But we're going to talk about how to work towards that optimized profile. I have a roadmap that literally lays all of it out in three steps of a process and I and, uh, came up with it myself. So hopefully you guys take value from it. But first, notice that I didn't mention the score in that whole screenshot, that whole slide that I was talking about. That might shock some people that are watching this and they were looking for an ideal score. Like, oh, is it when I get to 720, 750? When can I start applying for cards? Let's talk about um, the misconception online, which is score versus report. So a lot of times score is more easily shown. So if someone can say, hey, my score went up 30 points, my score went up 100 points that is actually pretty deceiving because the banks go off of your report details, which is kind of what's under the hood of that score. The score will get you through the door, right? Obviously, if you have a 600 or below or something like that, you're just not going to get considered. But even a 750 could get denied if the report details are not actually up to par after they you know, start reviewing your profile. And so the analogy I give here is like your GPA versus your transcript. So if I just am trying to apply for a college and I say, hey, I have a 3.0 uh, GPA. They can know, okay, I'm an average, a B student, but what if that particular college was really stressing that I have a good uh, grade in some sort of math class, right? And maybe my 3.0 was like all A's in every class except math, and I got an F in math. That would be really important for them to know. So they would want to pull up my transcript and, sit and see, why is he a 3.0 student? Is it the is oh this class this semester with this teacher and it was you know geometry or whatever that is going to clarify whether or not they want to have you as a student in that analogy right but in this case a customer at a bank so the score is like a gpa it's very surface level you can't tell much and the transcript is going to give you a lot more details and that's going to be the ultimate deciding factor same thing with your credit report and the banks so score can be deceiving. It does not tell the whole story. So you need to get out of the habit of thinking, what score do I need to get approved for that? Instead, you should be thinking, what should my report details be? And you should be basically trying to get those data points out of people if you're curious about what um, led to them getting such a good approval or whatever, right? If you guys ever seen in the comment sections, they'll be asking for data points. It's not just the score. We want to know all the details that we can. So what was their oldest credit card? What was their utilization on their you know, credit cards? What was their bank relationship with that bank? Stuff like that. A little more detailed than just the score. And so technically, this is how score was made up. So the way I remember it off the top of my head is uh, I basically kind of sing it in my head. And I go 35, 30, 15, 10, 10. That's the factors here. I don't always remember which ones are which, but I know that it's involving these five credit factors, right? And so here's something else you could screenshot if you want. Um, you know, 35% is going to be your payment history. Obviously, we just want to have that at 100% if we can. Never really want to miss a late payment. 30% uh, is the amounts owed. So that's your utilization. 15% is your credit age. 10% is credit mix. And the other 10%, I can't even see it right now because my screen is being covered, but that's the new credit. So yeah, that's uh, new credit accounts. But honestly, once you look at the report criteria, I basically don't need to know my score factors or worry about my score going up and down a few points here and there, I'm not going to freak out because I know that if my report details are on point, then even if the score moves around, I know that I'm in good shape. So 680 versus 685 is probably not going to be the difference between you getting approved or denied as long as what's under the hood, right? On those report details is basically the same. So ways that a score can be deceiving, uh, Vantage versus FICO, that's like just a scoring model off top. Credit Karma will give you a Vantage score instead of FICO. Vantage is, we'll say like it's an off-brand recipe, right? So it's using the same ingredients, but it's not the recipe that the banks want to use. So therefore, you shouldn't be basing your decisions off of what the Vantage score is showing. The Vantage score can be as much as 30 points off sometimes, high, higher or lower than your actual FICO. So um, again, we don't really like to make approval decisions or, or guesses based on that score, but even then, it's an inaccurate score to go off of. So always make sure that you're looking at a FICO score because that's what the banks use. Going deeper into that, there's FICO 8, FICO 9, et cetera, et cetera. But 
regardless, you, the point blank you should be looking at FICO scores. I'd say FICO 8 is the most common scoring model. And you can find a free uh, version of FICO 8 by just downloading the Experian app and getting the free version. You'll at least be able to see your Experian FICO 8 score. Uh, synthetic boosts from AU trade lines can make a score really deceiving. So somebody might be, you know, advertising, hey, I got somebody's score up 100 points because I added them onto an authorized user trade line. It could help for something like getting somebody into an apartment, possibly getting them a car loan at a better rate. Uh, some circumstances, a trade line could help with that boost in score. But when it comes to actual funding on the personal side, um, it doesn't make too much of a difference. But the point is that score can be looking a lot hotter than the profile actually is. So they could have boosted up to a 750, but if the only thing that's bringing them up to that 750 is that AU, that's just like a really, really good AU trade line, then they're probably not going to have really good results. They're probably just going to get through the door and then the banks are going to realize that, okay, it's not actually your real credit and uh, it won't be as good as somebody else who had a 750 from all primary accounts. And then they definitely, AUs definitely don't move the needle much in business funding. So keep that in mind as well. We can use AU strategically to get good personal rounds of sequences done. And then on the business side, you, you should not be leaning on AUs really much at all. Uh, another way score can be deceiving is we can have the same types of account or the same number of accounts. But if mine are bank issued from top banks and yours are store cards like Victoria's Secret, or you have, you know, the, the low tier builder products, and we both have, we'll say a 720, a bank could look at my report as better because I have a better quality of accounts. So the fact that I have a chase card with a $5,000 limit could be better than your, you know, uh, self lender secured credit card for a thousand, but we could both have a 720, right? Different profiles with the same score showing is deceiving as well. So it can have drastically different results. I could have a 750, you could have a 750. One of us can get denied, one of us can get approved. And I could even have one card that I've had for 20 years. And that could be the reason why I'm at a 750. And I think I'm fine. But in reality, I have a paper thin credit profile and, and it's basically propped up by only one account. And it's not really, it doesn't have depth to it versus somebody else who has you know, a car, a mortgage and you know a credit card. And yes, maybe that credit card is at 30%. So maybe they're not as uh, good of a score as they could be. But because there's real credit there, real depth, um, they could have a better result. So it's actually funny. Like there, there could be a ton of different combinations that could get you to a 750. So a 